Uh, I'd like to start by reading a statement from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8. <clears throat> Page 27 and 28. The world is a theater. Its actors, its inhabitants, are preparing to act their part in the last great drama. Are you getting ready to act your part in the last great drama? I hope so. The only way you can really prepare is if you are studying to know Jesus and to follow Jesus in your life. God has lost sight of. With the great masses of humanity, there is no unity except as men confederate to accomplish their purposes. That's all about globalization. God is looking on. His purposes in regard to his rebellious subjects will be fulfilled. The world has not been given into the hands of men, though God is permitting the elements of confusion and disorder to bear sway for a season. Is that true today? Yeah. Elements of confusion and disorder? A power from beneath is working to bring about the last scenes in the drama. What is working from beneath? Power. <clears throat> a power. What power is that? Satan. The power of Satan. The power of the, of the enemy. Satan, the, well, um, the last great scenes in the drama. Satan coming as Christ and working with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those who are binding themselves together in secret societies. Oh, well, Ellen White was a believer in secret societies and conspiracies too then, wasn't she? Oh. Those who are yielding to the passion for confederation are working out the plans of the enemy. Cause will be followed by effect. What does confederation mean? Globalization. Okay, yeah, or the confederation by definition is really the, the collaboration of different groups of people that join together to achieve a purpose. That's the same definition, really, almost the same anyway, as a conspiracy. <laughs> so it's really a conspiracy. But the, So <clears throat> this is talking about the confederation and secret societies. And there are many secret societies today, and their aim is to confederate the world into a global system of government and control. <clears throat> And this cannot happen without getting, the, getting total control of the economy. Did you hear what I said? The control comes through the economy. And in fact, that's what Revelation 13 tells us. That those who don't go along won't be able to buy or sell. That will freak them out. And they'll say, ah, I can't. I have to go along with the law. And they'll justify going along with the laws of the land. Turn to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. This is a popular or famous Adventist verse because we use verse 1 through 4 to talk about coming out of her, my people, the fourth angel's message. But I want to look at verses 11 through 19. 11 through 19. And it says, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. What's that talking about? The economy. The economy. That's talking about the economy. In other words, the, the world, the merchants of the world, the big dealers, you know, the central bankers, the massive global corporations. It says, There's going to be a crisis. That they're going to lose all their customers. It says no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And then it lists the merchandise through verse 13. And then come to verse 14. It says the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee. And all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee. And thou shalt find them no more at all. So there's going to be a crisis of the world's mega... Merchants. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and the merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, verse 15, shall stand afar off for fear of her torment. That's Rome's punishment. Weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company of ships, that's the transportation system, <clears throat> and sailors, and as many as trade by sea stood afar off, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads, and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein was made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. So in other words, <clears throat> uh, there's a great crisis coming upon the merchants of the earth, the central bankers and other businessmen. They will be in such bad, a bad place that they will throw dust on their heads and weep and mourn and cry and wail, you know. They're going to uh, lose their power and whole nations will go bankrupt. <clears throat> we saw some nations go bankrupt in the last few years, didn't we? Greece, Cyprus, etc. <clears throat> Pardon me, <clears throat> something in my throat. <clears throat> and it's going to happen suddenly, my friends. The money men of the earth, the corporate sharks, the central bankers, they're headed for a crash like they have never dreamed of. Thank you, sweetie. Appreciate that very much. They're headed for a crash, folks, like they've never dreamed of. <clears throat> the Bible says these merchants of the earth have collaborated with the Vatican to achieve enormous wealth. And I think we need to understand the Bible's teaching here because it's talking about the Vatican in relation to the money men of the earth. They're working together to control your life. They manipulate the economy to enrich themselves and it's like a game to them. While you, ha you and I struggle to make a few coins to rub together, they're living high on the hog. They suck the life out of your assets by manipulating the economic flows of the world. They've learned how to do this. They've mastered the art of this. They bleed your economic potential and hand it to a few bankers and merchants that control the system. And while this sounds unbelievable, it just happens to be true. And the more digitized a nation's money is, the easier it is for bankers to impose negative interest rates. What's negative interest rate? They charge you. That's where you pay the bank for them to hold on to your money, rather than them paying you to use your money for a while. It's, a, it's a, a complete change in philosophy concerning banking. But it cannot be imposed, negative interest rates cannot really be imposed while there's a lot of cash in society. Um, instead of paying interest to the lender, which is you, the customer, you pay the bank for the privilege of loaning them your money. If you are forced to keep all your funds in a digital format, banks can impose negative interest rates and suck more out of you than you could ever imagine. It's about as upside down as you can get. And if you don't think that it's not coming, or rather, if you don't think it's coming, think again. Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, and other nations all have negative interest rates and their economy is already almost completely digital. But the U.S. Federal Reserve recently discussed the possibility of negative interest rates as well. Negative rates could not exist in a free market and the, they dis, the negative interest rates destroy motivation to save and build capital which is the basis, the only basis of prosperity other than the Bible itself. If you don't like that plan, you can stash your cash under your mattress. 
cash limits how far governments and central banks can go with negative interest rates. The more it costs to store money, <clears throat> to store your money at the bank, the less inclined people are to do it. So they go to, uh, the banks go to uh, digital accounting to achieve their goals. You see what I'm saying? They get the cash out of society so then they can impose whatever they want on you. Of course, central planners don't want you to withdraw your money from the bank. This is the big reason they want, you, they want to eliminate cash. So you can't draw your money out from the bank. They want everybody to have a bank account. As long as your money stays in the bank, it's vulnerable to the sting of negative interest. And also helps to prop up the unsound fractional reserve banking system. And if you can't withdraw cash, you have two choices. You can accept negative interest rates or you spend your money. Ultimately, that's what central planners want. They want to use negative interest rates to force you to spend your money or otherwise have it taken from you a little at a time. The war on cash and negative interest rates are a huge threat to your financial security and liberty. Notice especially liberty. But why do the central bankers and the governments of the world want to control money flow? Well, it's money that makes the world go round, you know. Uh, money to these merchants is everything because they're getting rich by it. They have a vested interest in, in controlling money. And they use the economic system to their advantage. And when they have all the cash under their control, they can manipulate the system even more. Which, when I say the cash under control, meaning that it's all gone digital, but most of all, governments can control their citizens. It's not just the bankers. Governments can do it too. Remember, the governments of the world and the bankers work together. The central bank is connected to the government, see? So, <clears throat> by removing cash from society, governments are bringing all your transactions under their radar. In other words, you lose all your privacy. And when they bring all the economy into the digital environment, it gives them complete control over everything that goes on in your life. They know that most people cannot live without at least some money. They know that if they have all your money under control, they can track you, manipulate you into compliance with the new world order so that you are not free. It will strengthen globalization so it can be enforced more easily. A cashless economy gives the government the ability to centrally plan everything for you. Like communism, it gives even democratic governments complete control over their citizens. It's just another way around to the same thing. Often the media use a curious term, <laughs> a neutral sounding word, to describe the central planners and globalists. That word is policy makers. And there's a, there's, but there's no difference between central planners and policy makers. The communist central planners and the democratic policy makers, it's the same thing. <clears throat> and this is where the religious freedom comes into it. While governments and central banks are collaborating to organize a digital economy and enforcing it on the nations, creating more centralization of power in a globalized world, the papacy is standing by, ready to enforce her religion on everybody on the planet once those mechanisms are in place. See, they're still putting those mechanisms in place. Now, after all, Revelation 13, 8 says that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship the beast or the papacy. But how will that happen? That will happen by coercion. Economic coercion. Revelation verse 16 makes that clear. Verse thir chapter 13 verse 16 <clears throat> says that no man might buy or sell save he that had... Sorry, it's verse 17. Pardon me. Verse 17. That no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So, the merchants of the earth are already collaborating with the Vatican. And the technology men are part of it too. 
Yes? And without them, the digital economy would not work. No wonder it was so important for Pope Francis to meet with men like Eric Schmidt. Who's Eric Schmidt? He's the CEO of Alphabet. Now, what is Alphabet? It's a company that owns other companies. And you will know that you will know <clears throat> the connection with Eric Schmidt when I give you the name of the company that is the most well known. It starts with a G. Google, not Geico, Google. <laughs> That's right. Google is everywhere. Eric Schmidt is the, fa the, the CEO of Alphabet, the parent company of Google, and a number of other technology companies. Pope Francis also met with Tim Cook. Who's he? He's the CEO of Apple. Apple. <clears throat> and with Kevin Systrom. Who is he? He's the founder of Instagram. Very good. Somebody got it. Francis also met with Christine Lagarde. Who's she? She is the head of the, or the director of the International Monetary Fund of the IMF. You see what the Pope is doing? He's working to bring these technology and economic people together. In fact, <clears throat> the International Monetary Fund is a globalist financial institution that places money under the control of corrupt dictators of banana republics and other struggling nations who take some of it and hide it in those shell companies in protected places. The Pope has also had in, uh, um, audiences with Jim Young Kim, President of the World Bank, Mario Draghi, President of the European Central Bank, and others. You see, the economy is very important to the Vatican. If she's ever going to get control of worship and force everyone to worship in her way, she has to control the money. Because most people worship money. Oh, did you know that? Most people worship money. If she ever is going to enforce her worship, as the Bible says she will, she has to collaborate with the global corporations and individual CEOs to get rid of cash. Or at least minimize the use of cash so that governments and businesses will be able to enforce their will on the people in exchange for making them rich. That's why the Vatican is an organization that pushes globalism. The Vatican is one of the most powerful globalist organizations on the planet. But larger and more global solutions are being developed to remove your ability and your, pardon me, your liberty and independence and get everyone on the so-called economic grid so that every transaction can be tracked through international banking conglomerates and by governments. All right, so once the controls are in place, the enemy of souls can bring in the reign of the mark of the beast and enforce it with a no-buy, no-sell law on a global scale. In other words, unless you accept the mark of the beast, <clears throat> you won't be able to do business. You won't be able to live in the normal way. You can't conduct transactions or use your smartphone or your online banking account. You won't be able to walk into a store or shop and buy even a pack of chewing gum. You won't even be able to buy fuel or heat your home or pay your electric bill or your mortgage. In other words, you won't have any place to live, you won't have any place to go, and you won't have any place to hide if the powers uh, of the earth have their way. Surveillance will and already does surround you and you cannot escape. If you don't have cash and your bank assets are frozen, which refers to uh, locking up your money and making it inaccessible, you're stuck. The infrastructure for this already is essentially developed. Does that sound scary? Yes. Let me, remi let me remind you that in Christ there is no fear. Amen. <coughs> because Christ is proposing to do something that I mentioned earlier today. Christ is proposing to, to get you to the place where you voluntarily and willingly come completely under His management. 
And when that happens, my friends, your bread and water shall come from Christ through His agencies, but you will not go out and earn a living by buying and selling and working and getting a payroll. You will not survive by those things. And I think it's very important for us to think about what we're going to do when that time comes. Perhaps you can already be getting yourself off of the grid and into an infrastructure that works for you. But ultimately, you'll have to flee to the rocks and the mountains. Do you know what Ellen White says about that? In Maranatha, there's a very interesting, um, I don't have it with me, there's a very interesting statement in which she says, the angel led us into the mountains to a place, and he said, here you will be safe. Into the, into the, in, in some time, in some place in the inner areas of the mountains. She said, here you will be safe. Just wait here and be patient until the time of trouble shall be passed. So you're going to have to choose to rely totally on Christ or fall under the enemy's dominance. Which is it going to be? It's that simple. And what an amazing experience that will be to be dependent entirely on Christ to provide even your bread and water. You will be completely reliant on Christ to survive from day to day. That's not something that most people are ready to do. Are they? They're used to earning money so they can pay their bills. They're used to using their cash or their credit card or their smartphones to buy their groceries. Do you think God might have to feed you like He fed Elijah under the juniper tree? Think about that. How long did Elijah go on the strength of that meat? 40 days and 40 nights. Now that's not something that human beings are capable of doing under the normal circumstances. But if you are under Christ's feeding and He feeds you, He only has to feed you once in the last 40 days. If He wants to. Pretty good, isn't it? Imagine not having to eat and having the energy to climb a mountain, which is what Elijah did. Remember, Elijah went to Mount Horeb and climbed up the mountain hoping to have an experience with God. And so what this is all about is really about an experience with God. When you are totally dependent on Christ for even your food and water, then you are, having, you are being led into a very unique and deep experience with God Himself. Oh. Wow. Oh, I want that, don't you? Elijah longed to have the experience that Moses had to see God's glory. That's why he went back to Horeb. That's why he climbed up perhaps to the same place where Moses was. And then God shook the earth, you know, with an earthquake and a great wind and a fire. But God wasn't in any of those things. Where was God? In the still small voice. You see, he could not reveal himself to Elijah the same as he revealed himself to Moses. Because Elijah had different needs. Elijah had a different set of circumstances and personality and character. He had run from the clanging bell of Jezebel, you know, the bell part of her name. The Jezebel had been, 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 you know, threatening him and he'd run from this. So God had to treat him differently. God still treated him with respect, but he gave him exactly what Elijah needed. The still small voice. Remember, Elijah... It's not the fire and the storm and the earthquake. It's not the great deeds that you do to vindicate the name of God. It's when you follow the still small voice that really matters to God. God talks to you and you respond out of the, out of the inner sanctum of your heart. You respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. That's the lesson that Elijah was getting. And that's the lesson that God's people will get when they are experiencing the same kind of dependence. And God will teach each of us in our own way what this means. Imagine having that kind of walk with God. And it will be a walk like Noah, you know. You walk in righteousness to God. And it's like Enoch, where you walk in righteousness to the point where you just step over, as it were, 
into the, the heavenly kingdom. But there'll be a time, <clears throat> time of trouble such as never was. God's people are going to have to go through that. My father told me something when my mother was dying. It was very hard for me because we're a close family and I love my mother. And um, I was standing on the porch in the sunshine one April morning when, or, or maybe it was the end of March, it was springtime and flowers and trees were blooming and all these things were going on. This was down in North Carolina. And we were standing on the porch and I was expressing my sadness about mother's pain, because she had a lot of pain in her cancer. And my dad said something to me that just made a powerful impact on my mind and still is with me today. I'll never forget it. He said, Hal, he said, when we come to the end of our lives, we all suffer. He said, that's God's way of separating our affections from this earth so that we can place our hand in the hand of Christ. And I thought, oh, that is so good. Because that's, that's really the essence of it. It's the experience with Christ. So we have suffering and pain at the end of our lives. It's because God is trying to, to, to get us ready to take that step into the eternal world. Not that we go right away. We go into our graves for a while. But that we will be prepared then for the resurrection. And I thought, you know, that's so good. The time of trouble is that same process for God's people. It may not be the end of their lives, but they go through a huge crisis, a painful crisis, so that they can separate their affections from this earth and place their hand in the hand of Christ fully and completely so they no longer depend on themselves or anyone else but Christ. Here's a statement from Testimonies, Volume 8, page 28. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world. And a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. We who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. That involves cash. Until cash is controlled, Bible prophecy will not be completely fulfilled. And when it is, God's faithful people will be reduced to the barter system overnight. Most people will freak out when this happens. How will they survive? How will they pay their obligations, their debts, and their mortgages? How will they pay their credit card debt? How will they support their children's education? How will they plan for retirement? I dare say there are many of even God's people who have no idea what's coming upon them. They continue planning for a life of ease and tranquility, but they really don't realize that there is a storm brewing that will be to them as an overwhelming surprise. But all that is the big picture. Let's talk about the way this impacts our daily life. Smartphones with smart software can now be used to pay for things at the checkout counter. You don't even have to carry your credit cards around anymore, let alone cash. Just your smartphone is all you need, which you authorize with your fingerprint. Aha! Any of you use those devices already? No, you don't. No, I know you wouldn't. <laughs> Audrey is 90, almost 90. She doesn't even have a smartphone. Oh, you do? You have a smartphone or just a regular flip phone? Oh, boy. Good for you. <laughs> oh, boy. She's helping the New World Order. <laughs> but look, smart technology has taken over the world, all right? You know, nowadays, um, you only 
well, all of this is just going to increase over time. Technology is already being developed, for instance, to have items, have all the items on the shelf in the stores and shops to be RFID compatible. You know what that means? That means that, a, that it has a chip in the labeling somehow that can be read by a scanner at the checkout counter. All right? Now we have barcodes, but they will eventually go away or at least not be the main use. In other words, all you would have to do is pass your whole cart by the scanner and guess what? It tallies them all up instantly. Verifies, you verify your form of payment and all the items in your basket will be calculated and added up instantly. There's no need for the cashier to scan each item, item by item. No, no, individually, only pass by the scanner. Tap your phone on the payment device and out pops a receipt. Magic, right? Yes, sir. Hold on. <laughs> With all that technology also goes much of your freedom and your privacy. Perhaps a lot more than you realize and more, way more than you want to give up. When pizza is delivered to your door, the driver will have a smart device that you can tap with your phone and the pizza is paid for. The same will happen for other deliveries. Airlines already use scanners to track and report your baggage, check your boarding passes. They even have de payment devices for your credit card when you buy on board. Vending machines and toll roads are increasingly cashless. Immigration in many countries uses RFID technology to process passengers quickly. Paper use is down wherever these technologies exist and technologies are being developed to wipe out your need for cash. The aim of the globalists is to get rid of cash. And they're pushing this really hard right now. Just recently, some of the very wealthiest people on the planet were invited to a meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, back in January, for their annual economic discussion to forecast trends and try to understand what's going to come along the line that will impact them and their wealth and their prospects for gaining even more wealth. The Davos meeting is very important to these super rich. No doubt there are very many there who worship money and hoard it in their secret shell companies around the world. Okay, you know how they do. You understand how they do that, right? They go to, a, if you have money, you know, it's not about ownership. They don't want to own anything. You know, if you ask them how much they own, they'll say nothing. How much do you own? <laughs> well, I own nothing. God owns everything. But anyway, <laughs> but seriously, they're not interested in ownership, they are interested in control. So when they have a house or a bank account with a large amount of money, they go to some island that has laws, island nation that has laws that protect privacy, very high level of privacy laws. And they find a law firm in that country and they ask that law firm to set up a shell company so that they can then put their assets in the shell company. So the title to the property becomes, the, the owner to the title of that property becomes the shell company. The owner of the bank account becomes the shell company, see? And then they have another shell company that owns that shell company, and another shell company that owns those shell companies, and so on, like so many Russian dolls, okay? That's how it works. And there is, in that law firm, somebody who is assigned as the agent for your shell company. And their agreement with you is that they won't do anything to that shell company unless you instruct them to do so. So if you want to buy a house, you instruct the shell company to um, transfer money to that bank account to pay for that house. Shell company does it. And then the owner becomes a shell company. You have the house, you have the use of the house, you can use it all you want. And if it has an airstrip, you can fly your Learjet into the, into the backyard and use the house and, you know, come and go as you please. Hardly anybody even knows. It's all about secrecy and privacy. And the super rich have this down to a science. Too bad that God's people don't have it down to a science. You know, some of us perhaps 
could benefit from such things. Well, it wouldn't be me, I'm not very rich, but in fact, I don't have very much at all. But um, perhaps there are some that would. Um, anyway, this Davos meeting, the conclave of high priests of monetary policy, if you will, is almost invariably singing the same chorus every year and that only criminals and terrorists use high denomination of notes. This useful mantra gets people to think that they need to get rid of cash. It doesn't matter that it's actually not true. Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate and econo economist, made a few remarks at the meeting which would shock you. He suggested that the United States get rid of its cash, its $100 bills, its 50s, 20s, 10s, 5s, and even its almost worthless $1 bills. Stiglitz thinks that regular people don't need paper money at all. As usual, he made the claim that cash is only useful for drug dealers, terrorists, tax evaders, and money launderers. Anybody hear one of those? I don't think so. But that's not the whole story. Just take the Islamic State, for instance. While the US military and others have blown up billions of dollars of physical cash that, the, that was in the possession of the Islamic State, they still seem to continue their activities. They still seem to be able to carry on. The fact is that the most notorious terrorist group on the planet famously uses both the oldest currency, which is gold, and the world's newest currency, which is Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency that's digitized. And by the way, Bitcoin is also on the government radar. They do not like it because it removes the possibility of total control over the economy, Bitcoin. All right, wake him up. There we go. <laughs> All right, Bitcoin. All right. Ken Rogoff, Harvard professor and former official of the International Monetary Fund and Federal Reserve, recently published a book blatantly called The Curse of Cash. What's that about, do you think? Rogoff, like most of his colleagues, intend, contends that large bills like the $100 note and the 500 euro note are only used in drug trade, extortions, bribes, and human trafficking. In fact, they jokingly refer to the 500 euro note as the Bin Laden. <laughs> That's because apparently it's only used by terrorists. So the $100 bill is on the radar. How many of you have a $100 bill in your pocket today? At home, you had it at home. Huh? How many of you have one here today, in your pocket? You don't want to let it be known, I suppose, because you might get robbed on the way out of church, right? <laughs> you won't get robbed by anybody here. You know, there's only a couple of you that even have $100 bills. So what's the use of them, right? That's their argument, see? You're playing right into their hands. <laughs> and while these globalists parrot the old line that cash only facilitates illegal and illicit activity, nowadays, get this, drug dealers and prostitutes accept credit cards. Wow. And whatever you're selling on the street corner, hot dogs or marijuana, there are many payment solutions like Stripe, Square, uh, PayPal, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, and the list goes on and on. And they allow anyone to accept a credit card. So it doesn't matter anymore. Mm. But the elites have a reason why they continue to refrain the idea that all the scumbags of the world would disappear if we took away all the cash. They know that most good trusting people like yourself and myself will believe this line, especially if it's repeated enough. Fear, especially of terrorists, but also of other fears, drives much of what we do. 
So the elites, including government rulers, have jumped on the cash ban bandwagon. Removing cash from society isn't about solving tax problems or evasion or crime. There will still be plenty of that to go around. It's not about illegal activity. There will still be plenty of that too. It's about totalitarianism. Ever heard that word before? Taking away your liberty, your power of choice, and your freedom to live as you please. That's what it's all about. And now after the site, and by the way, there is another aspect of this that's not even being talked about, and that is the removal of your religious liberty when they get control of your economy. So, <clears throat> removing cash is their aim. And now, after the Cyprus crisis, you should know that when you deposit money into a bank account, it is no longer yours. What? That's right. It's no longer yours. You are merely an unsecured creditor when you put your money in a bank. And they have the power to freeze you out of your life savings without even giving you a courtesy call. Stiglitz, Summers, and Rogoff and their numerous cronies among the elites don't want that. They want a massive centralized bureaucracy to give you control, give con sorry, to have control over your savings. But it's more than merely getting control over your savings. It's deeper than surveillance and tracking. It's something of which even these economic high priests are not aware of. It is something very prophetic. They cannot scare you into compliance with global worship laws if they don't get control of every transaction on the planet. They would even like to control the barter if they could. And perhaps the barter will be the only way that underground transactions can occur in a digital economy if the elites have their way. So apparently the time has come for a push toward a cashless world again. And it's happening in many places. We've been tracking this now since 2003. Our first report on the cashless efforts was all the way back in 2003. That's 14 years ago. We continually report on this whenever something prophetically newsworthy comes to our attention. So pay attention. I think I just published something uh, that will either go up, either went up last week, but I don't think it did. I think it goes up either Monday or Tuesday on our website. Shortly after the Davos meeting in 2016, the European Commission, which is the most well-known sanctuary of statism, published a letter to the Council of Europe and the European Parliament about their action plan to further step up the fight against the financing of terrorism, as they call it, which in elite speak is for eliminating cash, among other things. The war on cash is happening faster and then we could have imagined 20 years ago. Every time we turn around, it seems, there's another major assault on cash. India is the most recent example in which the Narendra Modi government stunned the nation by demonetizing its two largest denominations of cash, the 500 and 1,000 rupee notes. <clears throat> and they did it overnight, leaving the entire nation in chaos. Modi is shoving millions of street vendors into cashless transactions and economic crisis. People can't buy their products right now because they don't have cash. Secondly, they don't know how to use the digital equipment. They aren't educated anyway, and so it's confusing to them. Modi's surprise unilateral announcement worked out in a high-level backroom of his home with a small group of his high-level insiders wiped out 86% of the nation's currency overnight, leaving the vendors at the markets to suffer huge losses. It also pushed millions of new users onto the digital economic grid by virtual fiat, forcing them to set up digital payments which would they, with, with which they were unfamiliar, even though they mo that most of their customers don't have the capability to make the digital payments. 
So the vendors were stuck, the individual buyers were stuck, and the government was forcing this on them. In other words, India tries to leapfrog to a less cash, less, ugh, my tongue tied, to a less cash use society or economy on par with developed nations. And they don't even have a consistent electrical grid that doesn't go up and down on a regular basis. You know, so anyway, I could go on about that for a while. It was quite a big thing last, what was it, November when he did that? I've forgotten exactly what date it was. But anyway, many Western countries are already largely ready for less cash. Larry Summers thinks the nations of the world should eliminate high denomination notes. And he said, nothing in the Indian experience gives us pause for recommending that no more large notes be created in the United States, Europe, and around the world. In other words, Summers thinks the U.S. should curtail the use of its $100 bills. There may come a time when the banks will start just pulling them out of the market and replacing them with 50s or something. The United States is essentially already digitally ready for cashless. Very few Americans carry cash with them anymore. How much do you have in your wallet today? Well, let me see. Ten, fifteen, twenty. Oh, I have more than I normally carry. <laughs> anyway, about thirty dollars. We don't need much cash. We hardly need money at all nowadays with phones and credit cards. How much do you have in your ca in your wallet? Do you have a hundred dollars in your wallet? I doubt it. Do you have fifty dollars in your wallet? Probably not even that. Many of you don't even have fifty dollars in your wallet. And I tell you, fifty dollars or a hundred dollars isn't very much. You can't buy very much. You can't buy a full load of basket of, uh, of, of um, groceries at the store for a hundred dollars. It's impossible. It's way more than that. My point is, Americans are already getting away from the use of cash and they're getting more and more comfortable all the time with digital applications. We've been using credit cards for years and years and years and there's a reason why. You see, um, Americans and for that matter Aussies and others, they have been incentivized to use cards by airline miles and cash back and other point systems, you know, and they give you free stuff after a while. And, um, you know, so as long as you're loyal and you buy from the same companies and organizations, they'll eventually start giving you free stuff. So we've all become very familiar with the cashless forms of payment. And they're just, the, the digital phone is just an advancement of cashless payments. So we're on the edge. The United States has already discontinued its $500 note. Canada has dropped its $1,000 note. Singapore has ceased issuing its $10,000 ringgit banknotes. And in a world where legal commerce is increasingly conducted via electronic payments, eliminating high denomination notes makes sense to these elites because it is a natural step toward cashless economies. Australia is already almost cashless now. Electronic non-cash transactions have soared and check payments have declined dramatically. And they're now a dying payment form. You still use checks here in this country, don't you? Yes, we do. We still use checks. But friends, that's going to end one day. Maybe not right away, but it will. And since Australia is to implement a new payments system in 2018, the use of checks will decline even further. What they're planning to do is institute a way to make payments so that there's an instant transfer. Digital payments instantly transfer from one bank to the other in real time. That's the key to making societies cashless. 
because there's trust involved. And if you, if you eliminate the need for trust by, by real-time payments, then you've solved a lot of problems, at least as they see it. Um, so Australia is about ready to go digital. It's not going to happen right away. There's still a lot to do to get people familiar, the older generation especially. The younger generation is already there. They just tap and go, one phone to the other, boom, it's done. You know. In fact, it wasn't long ago I bought a car in Australia for our work at Highwood. It's a little old car, um, a 2000 Mazda. And um, I went to the place where the car was and drove it around and I decided, okay, that's okay, we'll buy it. And the man said, well, how would you like to pay? I said, well, I don't have the cash. I can pay by, by bank transfer. He looked at me and he said, what bank? I said, ANZ or ANZ. He said, oh, he says, oh, that's, that's my bank. So we sat there on the table and I punched in the stuff on my cell phone to transfer the money to his bank account and we watched it as it came up on his, on his account. Bingo, there it was. Instant, or almost instant. And I drove the car away. <laughs> anyway, that's what happens. Um, They have a lot of reasons for doing what they're doing. I've already mentioned that, but let me explain something else. Supermarket customers in Britain are being given an opportunity to test a new technology. They're offered the chance to pay for their shopping using a fingerprint linked to their bank account, bypassing the cell phone and credit card altogether. So when they set up the payment system, you link your fingerprint to your, account, your bank account. When you go to the, the grocery store, you, you put all your car groceries in the cart, you go past the scanner, it scans them all at once, and then you put your fingerprint on there, and boom, it's done. Out comes the receipt. Fun, right? Yes, all these technologies are a lot of fun, but friends, where does it take us? The leaders in going cashless are the Scandinavian countries like Norway, Denmark, Sweden. They don't use cash anymore. In fact, in Sweden's metro system, uh, for many, many years, you can't buy a ticket for the metro in cash. Um, so they're very used to cashless payments. Um, Sweden's, of Sweden's 1,600 banks, 900 of them no longer accept cash deposits, nor do they keep cash on hand, and many rural branches no longer have ATMs. They've just taken them out. They're no, they're no use anymore. Over the last year, the circulation of the Swedish krona fell from 80 billion, sorry, to 80 billion from 106 billion krona. That's not a lot, actually. That's only about $10 billion. You might, that might sound like a lot to an individual, but for a whole country, that's nothing. Mobile apps have also taken off. As technology has become more ubiquitous, Swish, a hugely popular app in Sweden with over 9 million payments a month, allows customers to transfer money between banks in real time. There's no float time. It's instant. Swish has pretty much killed cash for most people as far as person-to-person -person payments are concerned. It has the same features as a cash payment, real-time clearing. Mobile apps with mini card readers attached to their phones are now common. Churches have also adopted cashless payments and one church reports 85% of their donations were made by phone. 85%, that's in Sweden. Sweden's Nordic neighbors, Norway and Denmark and Finland, are also fast becoming entirely cashless societies. 
maybe I should come around to meetings like this with a little device that I plug into my phone for credit card swiping. So if you want to make a gift, you make it by credit card. And then you, sign, you, you do a little signature on my phone. I did this one time. I went to a, <laughs> get this, I went to a GYC meeting. You know what GYC is, right? And there was a booth there, an exhibit, and they were selling some books. In fact, uh, Kent has one of the books that, that was on the table there with him today. But anyway, um, I wanted a couple of their other books. And they had a phone linked to the internet with a little device in it. And I swiped my card, and they came up with the correct amount. I verified that it was the correct amount, and I made the payment. Came in my credit card bill uh, the next time around. It's handy, right? <laughs> yes, well, it's preparing for cashless. Israel has established a special committee to study methods of bringing Israel into a cashless society. They've recommended a three-phase, uh, pardon me, plan to essentially do away with cash transactions in Israel altogether. Well, the reason for examining a cashless economy, says the government, as usual, is to combat money laundering, tax evasion, and maximize tax potential collection, as well as expand the tax base. You know, if people are working under the surface, you know, how can they enforce the law when it comes to taxation? So once they get everything up on the table and all transactions are monitored and tracked, well then you get more people into the tax system and you pay more into the government. So it's all about money for the government. The committee recommends greater restriction on the use of cash. Okay? For instance, um, their plan involves gradually limiting cash transactions for businesses immediately to 7,500 7, shekels, is it? Or about $2,100. And private cash transactions at 15,000 shekels or $4,300. Then later bring in lower limits as time goes on. And of course, stiff fines and other issues would happen for people who violate that. If governments are successful in enforcing a cashless society, they will not only have control of taxation, but they will also be in a position to freeze the assets of anyone who doesn't go along with their plans. Already, for instance, Australia is, is using, um, using penalties to force people to do things that they don't want to do. I'll give you an example. As of the beginning of this year, Australia now requires all children to be vaccinated. And if they are not vaccinated, the parents lose up to $15,000 of payments, child payments from the government, depending on how many children you have. You get so much a month just to support your children. And that could be up to $15,000 a year. Wow. That's coercive if you've ever seen it. And if you are dependent on the government for welfare or for child payments or any other kind of support and you don't go along with the government system, whatever it is, whether it's worship laws or vaccination laws or anything else, you lose your benefits. Now, who wants to lose their benefits? That has made their life easy. Well, that's the price you have to pay. In just a few years, in the last few years, Italy has made cash transactions over $1,000 illegal. Switzerland proposed banning cash payments in excess of 100,000 francs. Russia banned cash transactions over $10,000. Spain banned cash transactions over 2,500 euros. Mexico made cash payments of more than 200,000 pesos illegal. Uruguay banned cash transactions over $5,000. And France made cash transactions over 1,000 euros illegal down from the previous 3,000 euro limit. These were just some of the cashless or less cash moves going on around the world. And it's not just governments, it's also cities. The city of Bergamo, Italy, has, has been experimenting with cashless environment. 
And like Scandinavia, Amsterdam, another big city, is nearly cashless now. In Kenya, there is a payment system that allows millions of unbanked citizens to store digital cash on their phones and transfer it to anyone by text. Zimbabwe is similar with its own economic ecosystem. And there are many others. Cash is being relegated to a second class status. Revelation 13, verse 15 through 17 tells us that the mark of the beast will lead to cash restrictions, or rather payment restrictions, on anyone who does not accept it. The choice is yours. Who are you going to worship? Whatever, it, whatever that is, keep in mind that it will affect how you live in society. Either you'll be fully integrated or fully separated. Which do you choose? Which do you prefer? Well, I prefer to be integrated. However, I know that when integration requires me to break the law of God, I have to separate. So I might as well start getting used to it now. I might as well start getting used to finding ways to barter with people. <laughs> How many of you have made a barter in the last year? with someone. Oh, one or two of you. Very good. Keep it up. That could be very useful in the future, don't you think? If you barter, I'll give you something and you give me something in return. No cash, no check, no transfer of money or transaction of any kind, just a barter. Friends, we, we've got to think about these things. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, pages 423 to 425 makes this um, brings us into focus. Fearful is the issue to which the world is to be brought. The powers of earth, uniting to war against the commandments of God, will decree that no man may buy or sell, save he that has the mark of the beast, and finally, that whosoever refuses to receive the mark shall be put to death. The decree is not to be urged on the people blindly. Now, did you hear what I just said? The decree is not going to be urged upon the people blindly. blindly. That's right. In other words, everyone is to have sufficient light to make his decision intelligently. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth, especially controverted. And as the controversy extends to new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message, that's the latter rain, only maddens those who oppose it. And the clergy put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light, lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command. By what? Every, every means at their command, they endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. Do you think those means at their commands would be economic means? Yes. Of course it would. I'll read on. The church appeals to the strong arm of the civil power. Here's the statement. Kent, where is he? With the, With the baby. Oh, he's got to hear this. I got the statement right here. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power. And in this work, papists are solicited to come to the help of the Protestants. The movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided. The law is invoked against commandment keepers. They are threatened with fines. That's economic, isn't it? And imprisonment. And some are offered positions of influence. That's bribery or... Um, yeah, that's bribery. And, and other rewards and advantages, some of which could be economic. As inducements to reduce their faith, but their steadfast answer is, show us from the word of God our error. The same plea that was made by Luther under similar circumstances. And those who are arraigned before the courts make a strong vindication of the truth. And some who hear them are led to take their stand to keep the commandments of God. Thus... Light is brought before thousands and who otherwise would know nothing of these truths. That is 
in his manuscript. Trust him. That is Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, SOP, Volume 4, page 423 to 425. I'm not quite done with it. I have one more little paragraph to read. Conscientious obedience to the Word of God will be treated as rebellion. Affection will be alienated. Children will be disinherited and driven from home. The words of Paul will be literally fulfilled. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. As the defenders of truth refuse to honor the Sunday Sabbath, some of them will be thrust into prison, some will be exiled, some will be treated as slaves. To human wisdom, all this now seems impossible. But as the restraining spirit of God is withdrawn from men, they shall be under the control of Satan, who hates the divine precepts. There will be strange developments. The heart can be very cruel when God's fear and love are removed. Oh, my brothers and sisters, this is a description of the circumstances that you and I will face if we are faithful to God when a cashless society is thrust upon us. What is holding back the cashless society from, from being implemented now? Well, you can give a lot of human reasons. You know, there's too many elderly people that don't want to go to a cashless society. They're, they are used to using cash and they don't want to learn the new systems. And there are um, a few other human reasons, but friends, there is a reason that underlines them all or underlies them all. And that is that the angels of God are holding back the winds of strife. Amen. They are holding back the winds so that they will not blow until God's people are sealed in their foreheads. Amen. That's the bottom line. And only when God's people are sealed, then they can let them go. In mercy, God does that, my friends, so that you and I will have the opportunity to be more like Christ and learn to live victoriously over the enemy's temptations and that we will have a complete life of victory in Christ. That's what it's all about. <coughs> then, of course, all of this will come undone and unraveled and it'll just, you know, all these prophecies will be fulfilled. A cashless economy prepares society for the Bible's end time prediction concerning worship laws that will be controlling on who can spend and make money based on religious activity. This is similar to the way that it was in the Middle Ages when Rome controlled the world. Did you notice that part where papists are solicited to, help, to the help of the Protestants? That's a very interesting statement. The Protestants, the evangelicals, are the ones who are being the leaders in the end time movements in the United States. So we have to pay attention to the evangelicals because they're the ones who Ellen White classified as apostate Protestants. The evangelicals, we have to pay attention to them. And what are they doing right now? They're getting more power. They are positioning themselves to get more power through the Trump administration. Do you think they're going to let go of it once they can influence and promote and advocate for political parties and political leaders? Then what? And they're not going to give it up. Once they have it, they're going to keep it. Because the laws blocking them are removed. Once those laws are removed, the, the, the Johnson Amendment and, and perhaps some other things, once they're removed, they will have, they will have power to, put to, to, what do you call that, to um, perpetuate this, 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 this power. Friends, we need to be closer to Jesus than ever. These issues are big, but they are not being discussed very much, even from the pulpits of churches that should know better. Let us not forget that we have a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Your eternal destiny rests on the choices you make right now. And I'm not talking about whether to go digital or not, because all that's going to happen anyway. 
If you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, He will protect you and sustain you and supply your, your defense against the enemy Amen. when the time of trouble comes upon the world. Oh, my friends. It hardly goes without saying, but perhaps even today, I should say it here in this group. Please, give your heart to Jesus. Amen. Please, my friends, don't delay any longer to unite yourself with the truth of God and the three angels' messages. Give your heart to Christ so that He can become a, that you and He can become partners in the latter reign. Because that's what it is. It's a partnership. Let Christ have complete control of your life. Turn away from everything that you know is not according to God's will. I have to do the same in my life. So as whatever's happening in the political world is fascinating and as entertaining as that may be, let it not take your focus away from the prophecies that are being fulfilled even as the political leaders make fools of themselves in public. <laughs> well, isn't that what happens a lot of the time? Yes. Let Jesus have your complete attention, my friends. And let His law saturate your heart and your mind with His love. May God bless you. I've enjoyed spending this time with you.